you know? Did I do all that? Oh, yeah, I'm on. Good. Do you know what a privilege it is to hold this in your hand? You know what a sacred and holy thing it is for us to consider its content together. It's a fearful thing. It's a serious thing. And let me encourage you once again. Please bring your copy of God's holy word to worship. That you might work these words into your heart. And let's now turn to the New Testament book of 1 Timothy chapter 1. And listen to the word of God together. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And as you're turning, let me just say there's so much in this book. This is going to be a phenomenal journey and it's going to cover a great deal of content. It's going to be a challenge for me week to week to decide what to share and what, to, what, what can wait for the following week. It's, this is tough because this is dense and powerful. Let me just take us back to those first three verses that we read last week together. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul is an apostle with a capital A. He has been sent by, Je by Christ Jesus and God the Father with the message. This is the, this is the, the chain. Christ Jesus commands Paul to go and sends Paul with the word of God. And Paul goes with the word of God, in this case, to, the temp to Timothy. Timothy. And to Timothy it says, Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus our Lord. I have a lot of questions today. I want to ask you please to engage with me on these questions that I want to, uh, us to kind of think about. One of these questions that I want to ask, it just comes up right away, is, is Timothy saved? Yes, thank you very much. Timothy is saved. One person is convinced that Timothy is saved. Uh, please engage with me on these questions I want to ask you. Uh, that was not a hard one. So my question is, if Timothy was saved and has received the grace of God, the forgiveness of his sins, the mercy of the cross, and the peace that comes with it, and it says here, Paul says to him, uh, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there's your clue. He, he's definitely in there. Paul, Paul was certain that he was saved. Why is Paul praying for grace, mercy, and peace for him? Grace is that, that unmerited favor that he gives us, that he died for you when you didn't deserve it, and he, he gives you the righteousness of Christ. He gives you grace. Mercy, he doesn't give you what you deserve, but gives you something else. And that peace that washes over our life when all our sins are forgiven, we just sang about it. So why grace, mercy, and peace to somebody who's already saved? Well, you know there's saving grace and there's sustaining grace. We've learned about the abiding, strengthening grace for us in times of struggle. Grace that empowers the believer to face extraordinary challenges. That's the grace that is available to everyone who believes in Christ. Mercy is given. And in this case, mercy is given for ministry because ministry requires a lot of mercy from God. And peace in the storm. The peace that transcends all understanding given to believers who will give thanks and pray for everything and that peace will wash into their life. Grace, mercy, and peace, even for a believer like Timothy. And Timothy is going to need it because Timothy has a very hard job ahead of him. I want you to read with me now our passage for today. I was hoping to get through verse 11 today. I won't. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to try to pare this back so I don't kill you guys with too much content. And you're thinking, well, why aren't we getting a Mother's Day message today? Why couldn't we have heard about Hannah or something like that? Well, I had a verse in here for Mother's Day, by the way, it's, but it's in, the, uh, it's in the next paragraph. It says this, don't kill your fathers or mothers. So, uh, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. 
don't kill them. And some of your mothers are like, yes, and then that's all I needed to know. That's all my kids needed to know. They're killing me. Don't kill me. But we won't get to that verse today, I'm sorry to say. Verse 3 says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you make a man certain people not to teach what? False doctrines any longer. Or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is my faith. The, go- the goal of this command, this command to these teachers, these false teachers and their devotees, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have separated, some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for meeting with us today as we came to praise your name. Thank you, Lord, again for just how you love us and how you dwell with us and how you are with us now. God, help us not to understand that lightly. Help us not to make common this holy moment. God, help us to do the work to listen and learn and grow. We pray, God, that your word will now be used by the Holy Spirit to great effect in changing our lives, changing our homes, changing this church that belongs to you. And God, we pray that through the message, gospel might be heard. And Lord, that people will give their life to you today. Surrendering themselves fully to you, Jesus Christ, as their personal Lord and Savior. Through the broadcast in this room, God, we just pray for salvation to take place. Breakthroughs. Maybe today is the last thing that needed to be heard, Lord, that last piece so that somebody could be made free. So we pray that, Jesus, please. Holy Spirit, you're the only one that can do it. God, please. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. I, uh, it says, I urge you, Paul the Apostle says, I urge you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus. Stay there in Ephesus. As, as I look at the, the paragraph that we are dealing with today, honestly, I, the structure that we give, I, we begin with the perseverance problem. Perseverance problem. Stay. Have you ever been urged to stay somewhere where you really just didn't want to stay? Yeah? Yes, I, I see those nods. You, you ever been, you want to quit? Sometimes you just want to quit. Sometimes it's like, I can't do this, God. I, 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 I want to quit. Timothy's got a problem. The church at Ephesus now is, it has become something new. It's become an established church, big church. A big church that started with a bunch of people giving their lives. I mean, sacrificing everything to make sure that the name of Jesus Christ grows in power and is known all throughout the province of Asia, we read in Acts chapter 19. This church is something else, but now it's become an established church. In an established church, there's a new set of problems. There's a new set of temptations and Timothy has been left there to pastor them through a storm. Sometimes it's just easier to leave than to stay, isn't it? Sometimes pastors will do this. They'll they'll be like, oh, you know what? I don't have to face this problem. I can go down the road to an easier place, a church that's in a different developmental stage, and just go down and quit on what God wants them to do. What Timothy's facing Oh, it's hard to be in that indecision time, isn't it? It's hard to be in that time where you know what God wants you to do. But your heart says, I don't want to do it. There's a clash between will and surrender and obedience. There's a clash. A clash. And that makes me think of a song. Should I stay or should I go now? (laughs) 
should I stay or should I go now? If I stay, there will be trouble. And if I go, there will be double. So come on and let me know. Should I stay or should I go? Blah, 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 blah. Yep. The clash. <laughs> the clash of will and obedience. Paul, the apostle, with a capital A, was sent by Christ with his authority to command, at the command of God the Father. And he said, from Jesus, Timothy, please stay there in Ephesus. So that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So it's tough. It's tough. Perseverance. Struggle. Look at verse 18 of the same chapter of 1 Timothy 1.18. He says, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you might, what? Fight the battle well. Fight the battle. Timothy, if you don't stay and fight, the church of Ephesus is going to be lost. How many of you know churches that have been lost because people didn't stay and fight? I know several churches that were just taken over by selfish, self-centered, self-righteous, false teachers with the wrong heart, the wrong mind, the wrong motivation. Timothy, stay and fight and command. These are military words. You realize that? Stay, fight, command. This word command is mentioned eight times in First and Second Timothy. Perangeles. To command, to charge, to transmit a message. God through Jesus Christ, the command of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle Paul, the chain of command is here transmitting this message saying, take it to the pastor and tell these people they cannot do this anymore. Paul says, the instruction was entrusted to me, verse 11, 18. He says, I'm giving it to you. Now you, Timothy, pass it on and command it to the false teachers to no longer do that and their devotees. This word... False teachers is heterodidaskaleo. The hetero prefix means other. It's not just false, it's other. Other messages, something other, something different than what we've been teaching. Something strange. And the teaching is didaskaleo, but Paul actually made up a word for these people in this verse. It's a whole new Greek word that he made up. The heterodidaskalean. Didaskalean, I guess that's how you say it. False teachers. Teachers of false teaching. That's the word for them. And he says, you need to stay, Timothy, and you need to fight before we dial in closer to examine these teachers of different dog doctrines. I have questions. I have lots of questions. I told you that. Here's another question. Is this a private correspondence? Are we violating the privacy of Paul and Timothy by reading it? It's a letter from Paul to Timothy, right? So are we meant to read it? I, you know, I, I think I, I sometimes try to get inside your heads and wonder what you're thinking. Sometimes the look on your faces scare me. I'm like, oh, I don't know what that's all about. But if I was here last week, and honestly, I actually had this thought as, I, as we were approaching this book. If this is a pastoral epistle, uh, uh, instructions given to pastors and elders, then... If I were you, I might have thought to myself, well, why don't the pastors and elders go read it? Why don't you study it and do what it says, and why are you bothering us with it? But it's not a private correspondence. If you look at the last verse of this book, the last sentence of this book, chapter 6, verse 21, it says, I love that sound, whoo. A lot of you have a lot of pages in 1 Timothy. My goodness. <laughs> wow. Very, very big print, huh? <laughs> What's the last sentence say? Grace be with you all. So this is an open letter. It's a letter from Paul the Apostle with a capital A to Timothy the pastor, but it's open for everyone. And we learn here that not only is this a letter that's open to everybody, but also it's Paul's from the South because he says you all instead of you guys. Grace be. 
and you South Carolina folks can appreciate that. And the Texas Longhorn back here. Grace be with you all. Now I have another question. If it's a pastor's letter that's open to everyone... Do you think it got the false teachers' of attention? That's our next. That's our next point as we go through the. Uh, as we go through the paragraph, second question. Boop, 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 maybe, maybe not. Boop, boop, boop. Number two. Beep, bop, boop. All right. You give me a hard time. Number two. The certain people teaching false, different doctrines problem. That's what we have. This is an open letter. And again, see the chain of command. Christ, by the command of God, gives to the Apostle Paul, who speaks to the pastor Timothy. And he says, Timothy, you need to command certain people. Doom, doom, doom. Pass it on. This is it. Teachers who teach differently. You need to command them. Do you think those teachers read this or heard this? read in public in the gathering of the church and said, oh, uh uh-oh, uh-oh, we might be in trouble. We need to do something. Sometimes it's astounding what we don't actually catch in church. Sometimes it's amazing. We, We just sit here and we think, I wish somebody else would have been here to hear that. That was really good. Oh, if so and so would have been here, boy, they they really needed to hear that, Velma. Yeah. And we just don't let it sink in and take it to our own heart and go, what? That was for me. Guess what? This is for you and me. Some of these guys, even though they're they're being spoken directly to, probably won't get it. Six years earlier, six years earlier, we read about it in Acts 20, 28. Paul met with the elders of the Ephesian church. Uh, in Miletus, he called them all together, had a big elders meeting of the elders of the Ephesian church, and Paul came off the ship and walked up there, and he met with them, and he said this to them, among other things, he says, Keep watch over yourselves, you elders, and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you elders. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. It's not your church. It's Christ's church. He bought it with his blood. You better be shepherds of that church. And he says, I know. I know, look at the certainty of that. I know that after I leave, what's going to happen? Savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. I know this is going to happen. Verse 30, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. He warned them. That they didn't hear it then and they're not hearing it now. They they just think this applies to somebody else. They're they're completely numb to the word of God. Jesus warned in Matthew 7, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. There are so many warnings in the Old Testament and New Testament about false prophets and false teachers. Peter, in 2 Peter 2, verse 1, it says, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there, again, look at the certainty, will be false teachers among you. Here's another question. If false teachers teaching destructive and distractive doctrines are promised, is it possible that they're already here? Okay. Good. You guys answered that one good. You're paying attention. We usually think no. I pastored a church for many, many, many years. I preached Acts 20 and and saw the certainty that false teachers were coming. And I said to our church in that day, false teachers are coming. Let's be in the Word so that we recognize them when they're here. Let's make sure that we know the Word of God so that we can sniff it out and we can cut it off. I pastored that church for many years. Wolves were coming to lead people astray. It was promised What I didn't know is that they were already there. They were already there. we got to be conscious of this. I'll tell you a little story, and some of you may have heard some of this before, but I'll tell it again. 
There were two men. One was a deacon and a long-time Sunday school teacher with a big class of adults, ages 60-something to 80-something. You know how... You know how everybody just won't graduate to the next class? Two men who were giving away a little blue book subversively among the members, those that they could pull aside and share their knowledge of. This little book expressed what they believed, which was there was no such thing as a trinity, that the Holy Spirit didn't exist, and that Christ was not God. I didn't know this was happening. I'd been there for years. I didn't know this was happening. This man had been teaching Sunday school for 15 years. A visiting preacher attended that Sunday school class. He came to me and he says, you've got a problem. You need to command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. called in my friend, that man I'd known for years. And I said, tell me about your views on the Trinity, the divinity of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And he goes, well, I guess you got me. I guess we'll have to talk. That was hard. That was hard. The wolves can already be here. Wolves destroying the sheep, teaching different doctrine, gathering disciples after themselves. I want to say something to you, and you need to hear this because it's so true, although some of you today won't believe this. Some of you will nod and smile and go, yeah, 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 that's what they say in church, but you personally don't believe this to be true. But it is true. To believe wrongly about the gospel of salvation is to be eternally lost. To believe wrongly about the gospel of salvation is to be eternally lost. Paul said this about his own people, the Jews. He said, you're so zealous, you're so religious, you are so passionate about your religion. But your religion is not based on knowledge. Your religion is based on your self-righteousness and your efforts. And you're still lost. And Paul said, I wish I could give my own salvation for you. But you're not going to have it. You won't listen. You won't submit to the gospel. If you're wrong about the gospel, you're lost. And if a teacher comes along that, that, that gives you peace in your fallacy, in your, in your incorrectness, he secures you for hell. Wolves coming in to lead people astray. Those two men in that church that I pastored were millionaires. And they had a good friend that was homebound in our church who was also a millionaire, and all three of those millionaires left our church. Because I said, you can no longer pastor, you can no longer teach this. I thought to myself, are those three cats totally undergirding this church's finances? It scared me to death. Faith is hard. Faith is hard. I wanted to go to another church. <laughs> should I stay or should I? You know what happened? Those three families left the church along with a few others. And our offerings went up. We never felt it. We never felt it. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You can trust Him. Have faith and obey Him. The question, should we be alert to the possibility of false teachers, is absolutely. Not only should we be alert to the possibility of false teachers, we should be alert and aware of the promise of false teachers. They are coming. They might be already here. And some false teachers don't know that they're false teachers. Some false teachers don't know that they're false teachers. Some do. They're subversive and they have secret little things they do. But some don't know that they're false teachers. So let me ask you, teachers, talking to you now, 
If you are a teacher and leader in this church or another church, and we have some today that are in ministry, and I'm so glad that God brought you here today. There's a reason. Are you readily in the change of the church command? There's a change. There's the word of God by the command of Christ, given by God our Savior. There's the word of God, and it comes down through the word. There's no longer apostolic authority where some man can come along and say, I'm a capital A apostle. It's all here now, not to be added to or taken away from. Amen to that. It's all here, comes from God with all authority, and the pastors and the elders, they teach the word of God, and they obey the word of God, and they, they make sure that the church is growing in the Word of God. So if you're teaching in this church, are you readily in the chain of the church command? Or are you more about building your class or your group and drawing disciples after yourself? That's what Paul warned them, the Ephesus elders in Miletus in Acts 20. He says, there's going to be some, even among your own number, they're going to draw disciples after themselves. They're going to, it's going to be about them, about me. Is that what you're doing? Maybe you're a false teacher and you don't know. Are you critical of church decisions and leaders, saying sarcastic and critical things to those who listen to you? And you don't realize what you're doing is you're trying to carve out a following after yourself away from this body which we are all in together. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. You're thinking about it. Teachers, ask yourself, what are you teaching and why? Are you trying to impress with your, your nuanced knowledge, the new things that you're pulling out of passages? In Ephesus, it was myths and endless genealogies and speculations. Building theology in the gaps. You know, we, we know so much because God has revealed so much. It's solid truth. We can stand on it. Uh, we can build on it. If a storm comes, we, 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 we live on it and the storm won't wash us away like those who don't live by the... And they get sand, washes their house away. We, we know, solid truth. But there's gaps. We have to admit there's gaps where we're like, eh, I don't know. Some people ask me questions about something. I have something nuanced or in between in a gap somewhere of what we know and what we don't know. And I, I don't know, okay? We're not to build theology on the gaps, as many do. We build theology on the solid things, the rocks, the truth. Creation, six days on the seventh he rested. You know, we don't know if he drank lemonade. There's a lot of gaps there. We don't know what he did when he rested, you know. There's things that are speculation. But we know that he said, let's make man and woman in our image. There's the triune God from the very beginning when the Spirit hovered over the waters. Sin brought about a curse on all people, and that curse brought death and decay on the world. A Savior was promised, and that Savior is in every page of this book. Every bit of it points to Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. He was promised, and He came, and He lived, and He died, and He rose again, and He ascended to heaven. He was the Savior, and everyone who seeks forgiveness for their sins by confessing Christ Jesus as Lord will be saved. These things are true and indisputable. Different and other doctrines come from dwelling in the gaps, speculations and myths, things that arise that are just, where did this come from? Things like purgatory. Where did that come from? Naming demons, claiming dominions. There are different teachings that come from sources that dwell in speculation rather than truth. There, there are books that are not authoritative, like the Apocrypha, good history, lots of myths, the Haggadah, the opinions of the rabbis, and myths, things where it was just building stuff in the gaps, speculations, the Pseudepigrapha, the false books, the, the books like the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Timothy, these are not scripture. They're myths and speculations and endless genealogies. The Book of Mormon, the Koran, both of those are ripoffs of what God did with Moses on Sinai. God met with Moses and gave him the law. 
And Muhammad came along and said, I'll go in a cave and let God give me a book too. And Joseph Smith went up on a hill and said, well, I'll just play along and God will give me a book too. These are speculations. They're not truth. Galatians 1, 6. The apostle says, in the power of the Spirit, in great zeal, he says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But if, even if, look at verses 8 and 9, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, and so now say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Verses 8 and 9 say the same thing. Back-to-back verses. I don't know when that happens in Scripture other than that. The last four verses of the Bible begin with these two. Verse, Revelation 22, 18. I, Jesus says, I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away that from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. You just don't take anything away from this. You don't add anything to it. It's complete. The word of God. And Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and doctrine closely. Watch your life and doctrine closely. So let's think about our lives. Teacher, are you humble? Are you humble, teachers? There's no room for pride in a teacher of God's word. None. We have way too much to learn to think that we've got it all figured out and that somebody else can't teach us. And in my 32 years, I'll tell you this, in my 32 years, I'm not 32 years old, by the way. You're like, really? Really? I've been in church ministry 32 years, 19 as a senior pastor, 6 as a foreign missionary. And I've never found a group more consistently unwilling to participate in training and further development of their skills than adult Sunday school teachers. They already know everything. Hey, let's have a Sunday school training. Let's get together and work on our skills. Yeah, I got that. I've been doing that for 30 years. I don't need no help. You might be surprised how much help you need. And me too. In your teaching, teacher, are you focused on speculative things that promote controversies? Or are you focused on equipping your group for advancing God's work? That's the purpose of your group. That's the purpose of your teaching. To not focus on speculations but on advancing God's work. That word work means our stewardship, God's plan. Your group, your class is a trust from God, and your purpose for being there is to equip them with the gospel, encourage them to share it, and engage alongside with them so that they can feel comfortable doing it when you're not there. That's your role, Sunday school teacher. That's your role, church leader. Equip, encourage, engage. To advance the kingdom of God. Be a soul winning class. That's your job. Not sitting around speculating. Well, I wonder about this. I wonder about me. Well, I just wonder. Really. Did you ever look at them genealogies? I heard a story once. Might be controversial. Well, then don't go there. Some teachers don't know that they're heterodidescaline. Some do, and they do secret things intentionally leading people astray. Both are used by demons to hurt the church and the advancement, and the advancement of God's kingdom. And so the pastor is told to command false teachers not to do that any longer, and he commands their devotees to devote themselves no longer to myths and endless genealogies and speculations. If you are a devotee of a teacher in this church, and I hope that's all of you, look at their life and look at their doctrine. Are they humble? Do they respond well to correction? Is there an air of conceit? If you look at chapter 6, verse 4, 
Speaking about these same people, it says they're conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels. Is there an air of, dis- of conceit? Is their life and home godly, giving evidence that they're actually practicing what they're preaching, that they have genuine faith? 1 Timothy 1, 7 here in our passage today says they want to be teachers of the law. They want to be teachers of the law. Okay, now we're, this church began with, with church planting. People, you know, Paul is working, he's building tents, they're taking his rag, and people are getting healed by the rag. All kinds of crazy stuff is happening, but this is ground, earth, ground roots work of gospel sharing and, and, and training up people. This, and this is beautiful, natural, but now it's become established, and all of a sudden there's positions, and there's prestige, and there's authority. And these guys who weren't there probably for the struggle of making this happen and putting their life on the line, now they want positions in the establishment. They want to be considered rabbis. They want to be considered teachers of the law. Mm. Look at me and become a disciple after me. Jesus said about these guys and people like them, Everything they do is, for people to, is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels and their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and be called rabbi by others. So look at their lives and look at their doctrine. Is your class sitting around thinking about theoretical things or are they working together to become a gospel-sharing, soul-winning, kingdom-advancing group? I'll read it again. Is your class sitting and thinking about theoreticals or are you working together to be a gospel-sharing, soul-winning, kingdom-advancing group? Number three. The purpose of the command, and this is where we finish today, Verse 5 says, the goal of this command is love. That's agape love, unconditional love, the love that we only find in God. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Your Bible study time should have the goal of the people participating in that, experiencing the love of God. That somehow, some way, through the teaching, they understand God loves you. God desperately, He loves you unconditionally. His grace has been poured out for you. He has died for you. You need to understand in the teaching that God loves you and that He desires to, for you to love Him back. The goal is love. The goal is love. Agape love. And a pure heart. A pure heart. Psalm 24, 3 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear by false gods. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their Savior. The goal of your class, the goal of your Bible study group needs to be experiencing agape love, and developing a pure heart. People in your class are living real life every week and sometimes they're messing up and you need to remind them that they can confess their sins and he's faithful and just to forgive their sins and to cleanse their hearts from all unrighteousness. A good conscience. Your conscience is your inner judge and in your class it is so... It's so great when you see a class developing and people are doing, actually doing, what God says to do. That rarely happens, and that's why everybody walks around kind of like, oh, I wish I could have done that. I messed up again this week. And we're walking around in shame because our consciences are condemning us because we're not being obedient. In your Bible study groups... Experience the agape love. Return to a pure heart and do what God says so that you have a clean conscience, a good conscience. And finally, sincere faith. 
everyone in your class, do they truly, truly, truly know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? We go to church all the time, and all the time there's people who don't really understand that they haven't yet given their life to Christ. They've done a bunch of religious stuff, but they haven't given their life to Christ yet. And so we have to make it real in our Bible study times. Have you given, sincerely given, your life to Christ and put your faith in Him and trusted Him for your salvation? And are you trusting Him now with your struggles and experiencing His victories as you step out in faith? Joey's going to come and he's going to lead us in a song and we're going to have a time now to respond to this. Did you today say, boy, I wish so-and-so would have been here. They really needed to hear that. I'm telling you again, this was for you and it was for me. It's a fearful and a sacred thing to open up this word. And God does not want us to be hearers only or a bunch of talk and chatter and theory and speculation and myths. He wants us to have this word wash our lives and change our lives that's the point. That's the point. That's the point. And so what are you to do with this today? Maybe you need to go back to your Sunday school class teacher and say, hey, we've been missing the goal. The goal was love and a pure heart and a, clean, a good conscience and sincere faith. What's God telling you to do today? Is today the day where you finally give up and surrender and say, Jesus, you win. I'm going to give you my life. Are you supposed to be a part of this church? This church is going to be about this. If I get off of it, they'll fire me, and I'm glad. So what's God telling you to do? Let me pray for us now, and then you respond as God leads you. Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for this time. God, thank you for your word and how powerful it is. Forgive us, Lord, for speculating and dealing with myths when we're supposed to be having our lives changed in your word. Oh God, we do need to ask for forgiveness. I need to ask for forgiveness for dwelling on things that are speculative. speculative. God, move us, change us. Make us what you want us to be as your church that you bought with your blood. And we pray now that we'll just let go. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Won't you stand?